Faster than expected, it's turned into autumn in the forest. The forests are colourful now, and the light shows its magic. Golden October, a firework of colours, but sadly only for a short time. Because then the wind of the first autumn storms blows the leaves from the trees. The forest strips itself bare. Soon thick clouds will block out the sun. Now the colourful display is finally over. The forest looks sad. Autumn moves relentlessly into its final phase. And the days I spend in the forest are noticeably shorter. By the time I next visit the forest, it's already November. The forest is readying itself for winter, and it seems as though it is retiring for a rest. Wistfully, I think back to the pretty summer's days that I spent here in my forest. November means having to say goodbye in the forest too. For some trees, their last hour is striking. Standing upright, they die a natural death. Suddenly, without any apparent reason, some rotten trunks just fall over. But life in the forest continues. Even for an agile berry collector like the blackbird, it isn't always easy to get to the fruits of the holly. Especially if it's too far away. The green leaves change to yellow and red. The trees are getting ready for winter. The last month of the year has started. It's quiet now, hardly a bird can be heard. The forest is deserted, bleak. But yet again it reveals a little secret. Between the naked trees I discover something extraordinary. Evergreen ferns bring juicy colour into the bleak forest. Different moss types come to the fore, which would hardly have been noticed in the lush summer forest. This way the forest still has some green colour, and green after all is the colour of hope. And I know another little secret. A shrub that in some years is already flowering, even in December. The Daphne mesereum shrub, whose flowers sprout from the stem. A phenomena that is usually only known in tropical plants. It creates a hint of spring in the forest. Even though winter is just round the corner. Because when the sky is this monotone grey, then the time has come for the first snow.
It is the morning after that compels me back into the forest. Ice cold wind blows into my face. In my warm winter clothes, nicely wrapped up, I watch a little, pitifully small chaffinch who is busy gathering food. The first snow means that it is even harder for the animals in the forest to find their daily food. Unless they took precautions. But even then, it isn't always easy to locate the hidden supplies. Added to the cold, there is a light snowfall. It is quite uncomfortable in the forest. Even before the first snow, the winter guests have come here from the birch forests of Russia, the Bramblings, which in size and shape are very similar to our domestic chaffinch. In droves of several hundred finches, in our comparatively mild winter, they search the forest floor for beech nuts. Bramblings and chaffinches, peacefully side by side, each individually looking for food. Multiculturalism in German forests, utterly untroubled. Now and again the whole flock flies up into the trees, only for safety. The snowy forest floor reads like a field guide. Here are traces of a flock of finches. There the traces of a hare and a fox. Findings that would have been hidden to me had it not been for the snow. Even though my animal observations are sparse at this time of the year, I experience the forest all the more intensely. More and more I become aware of how privileged I am to be able to experience nature close up. A look at my forest diary tells me that today is a special day. It is the 21st of December and that means the start of winter. In the northern hemisphere today is the shortest day and subsequently the longest night. The sun reaches its lowest point of the year. Just the thought that, as of tomorrow, the days will be getting longer again, makes me happy. And not to forget, Christmas is just round the corner. Forest Christmas. The new year begins with so much snow as I have not experienced in a long time. This heavy snowfall is really out of the ordinary. This white brightness covers everything like a glittering warming blanket. The forest becomes a magical place. Snowflake, white dress, a song from my childhood springs to mind. There is a nearly mystical calm in the forest. Nothing can be heard and nothing can be seen. Suddenly dark shapes cross my path. Did they not see me? Carefully I check the wind. 
It is in my favour. The wild boar cannot smell me. A whole family out and about, and in this weather. They are being driven by hunger, otherwise they would never eat the beech twigs. But wild boar are omnivores, I know that. Even with a covering of snow, their acute sense of smell helps them find something. Did they notice me? Has the wind turned? And is it now coming from my direction? No, I was lucky, and they aren't running away. I enjoy this rare moment, and I am pleased that the sounder, the group, stays intact. How good that the wild boars build up a layer of fat in the autumn, otherwise they would not survive the cold and the snow. I feel that the wind has changed and the animals are becoming restless. That was that. Soon they'll run off. But one wild boar stands as if rooted on the spot and stares over at me. Carefully, quietly, I retreat. Big snowflakes come down incessantly and the sky is still full of snow. Toward midday the clouds draw back and reveal the sun. Fresh snow added to blue skies and sunshine. The landscape is turned into a winter wonderland. Very early in the year, the ravens begin their courtship displays. Distrustfully, a raven couple watch another raven fly by. I wonder what he wants. Perhaps he's looking for a new partner, because, as far as I'm aware, ravens mate for life. A few moments later, the tension eases again. Everywhere in the forest, the snow cover is making the search for food difficult for the animals, regardless if big or small. For the bank vole, every step on the snow means mortal danger, as it is no longer camouflaged. Accordingly, it is cautious and checks carefully if it can risk another excursion. Even though the wood pigeon is itself only looking for food, the little vole feels threatened and flees. Under the snow, the forest floor is frozen solid. Bad times for all looking for food. There is nothing to eat here for the middle spotted woodpecker. Even though I'm wrapped up warmly in my cosy jacket, woolen hat and thermo boots, standing out here I slowly begin to get cold. Now I understand why winter for most animals is a time of need and why many don't get to see the next spring. 
small birds especially need to feed several times a day in order to adequately provide their bodies with food. They cannot build up a layer of fat like the wild boar to offer them reserves. For me, it is one of the forest's many secrets how they survive the frosty days and freezing nights. But it is not only the cold that is a danger to them, lack of food is too. Now, in particular, the old law, eat or be eaten, applies. Nature makes no exception at any time of the year. If you're not careful now, you might quickly become prey. Hunger drives the wild cat early from its warm hiding place. Has she spotted me? A quiet rustle distracts her. Despite the cold, I try to stand absolutely still. Tense, I watch a second cat heading straight towards me. For a few seconds I stand eye to eye with this magnificent creature. An experience I'll never forget. As much as I like the snowy winter forest, I'm really looking forward to spring. But before that, there are numerous cold January days and winter keeps an ever firm grip on nature. Of course, for me, this time of the year also has nice aspects. I don't mind the cold anymore. Quite the opposite, I enjoy the clear winter air. In February, the sun is a little higher over the forest, and the first messengers of spring have awoken. Is the winter already saying goodbye? Is the snow really going to melt? With every day the sun grows stronger. And indeed, the snow falls from the trees, a thaw sets in. Winter slowly loses its power. Early bloomers, like the colt's foot, turn their flowers towards the sun. Everywhere, meltwater is dripping from shrubs and trees. Under the ice, there is the tinkle of little rivulets. 
It appears as though nature was only waiting for a sign. The warm air from the south creates a little scene on the still frozen forest floor. The winter forest suddenly becomes a ghost forest. One morning, the snow is gone, a lot earlier than in the previous year, my forest diary confirms. In the next few days, the two ravens will be guarding a first egg in their nest. Not really lovingly, he plucks at her neck feathers. But despite this, to me, it looks like she is enjoying this contact. Maybe I'm mistaken. Maybe this is a great proof of love for ravens. The roebuck is off on his own, even though roe deer form communities out of need during the winter. The ravens can take their time, because over in the beech forest their nest is already built. They regularly fly there together. Usually, the male flies off first. The female follows him. The nest has been in the same tree for many years, high up in the crown of a beech tree. The loner still stands on the outskirts of the forest. The rough leaves of the blackberry are now his favourite food. I calmly look at the silky cover over his handsome antlers, which the hunters call velvet. Under this protective layer, a new antler grows every year, with which he will defend himself against rivals. In a few weeks, the antler is fully grown, and then the roebuck will scrape off the excess velvet cover. Every day it is light for longer, so I am able to expand my excursions into the forest. Wet and cold is how March begins in this year. It is uncomfortable and yet I am still drawn into the forest. It is eerily still. I can hardly recognise anything as the forest is covered in thick fog. A light breeze lifts the early morning mist. Two hours later, the sun gradually fights through the fog and creates a completely new picture of the forest.
Over the forest, big clouds form that make it hard for the sun. Where the sun can break through, it gives the forest a different face. A first hint of spring can be felt, even if it is a little early. I hear cranes returning to their summer quarters. From the behaviour of the ravens, I assume that the young have hatched. Sadly, I can't look into the nest. But instead, I find pleasure watching the aerial acrobatics of the adults. Eventually, in the late afternoon, nature glows in the light of the March sun. Immediately, the forest turns into a stage again, on which I see and hear old acquaintances, like the robin. The spotted woodpecker cleans his feathers thoroughly to rid himself of unwanted tenants, like lice or mites, which spent the winter in his feathers. Other birds, like the raven, prefer a cleansing bath. Already in March I can hear the woodpeckers acoustically marking their territory. Only a few trees further, a couple of blue tits are moving into their new home for the first brood of the year. The drumming of the woodpecker can be heard from now until early summer. This is a particularly cheeky bird, at least in my view, the nuthatch. He often argues with his landlord and proves to be an aggressive neighbour. Another wolf in sheep's clothing. His cute looks and his melancholic song often make me forget that the robin redbreast is an argumentative bird. It's mid-March and a very shy bird returns to the forest from his winter break in the south in order to rear his children here, the black stork. He waits every year for the return of his female, which usually happens about two weeks after his arrival in the breeding area. Now nature is literally in the starting blocks, but the early flowering plants like the spring snowflakes are already rearing their heads out, much to the delight of the wild bees. The seasonal clock continues unabated. It is April, the month with the highest number of weather-related cavortings. Everywhere in the forest, plants are sprouting from the ground. The frost has finally gone. From one hour to the next, the weather can change. The wind is driving in dark rain clouds. 
On the horizon, I can see how the weather front approaches unabated. Next to me, the rain drips onto the dried leaves. After a few moments, the rain changes into snow. Classic April weather, as I have known it since my childhood. For a moment, the winter returns to the forest. A short while later, the snow turns to rain again, and the sun puts an end to this scenario. As if nothing had just happened, the blackbird continues her song. The ravens circle close to their nesting tree. Their behaviour makes me curious. And look here, the young birds are stretching their necks upwards. Excitedly, one of the older birds flies through the forest and eventually lands on a branch from which it can watch the nest carefully. Only when the older birds feel unwatched do they approach the nest for feedings. The slightest disturbance causes them to avoid the nest and they will leave their young hungry until the perceived threat has passed. Maybe that's why they are thought to be bad parents. While one of the older birds is with the young, the other watches the area. And only when the all clear is given will he leave the nest. My path today leads me past the old oak tree that for many years has provided a home to bank voles. I do not have to wait long. I spot a vole that wants to leave its home. Quick as lightning, it runs off. I can only watch her for a moment, then she vanishes again. Not far from here, among the thick beech trunks around the old forester's house, black woodpeckers, the largest among our woodpeckers, are breeding, as they do nearly every year. As I see, this time he is happy merely with the refurbished old building on which he is working. A new hole is not created every year. Still a little damaged from the winter, I spot the nest of the southern wood ant. The ant colony is like a little monarchy. In the inner nest mound, the queen lives. There are guards and workers. An ant heap reminds me of a huge city with millions of inhabitants in the middle of the forest, only organised perfectly. Every day, more migratory birds return here to the forest. The red kite, easily recognised by its wedge-shaped crenated tail, is one of them. From year to year I observe an increasing number of starlings that have changed their migration pattern and that stay here all year round. Probably our winters are not so cold for them anymore, so they can save themselves the long trip. And then the time has come. As if on command, the singers begin to perform the biggest singing competition in the forest. The calls of the male chaffinch at this time can be heard everywhere and at all times. The missile thrush is one of the first singers in the year.
While she sings, another, the song thrush, is already collecting building materials for the nest. Then a very small singer with a massive voice enters the stage, the Eurasian wren. In comparison to such a song, the chatty chirping of the starling sounds a little unimaginative. Another small singer, the Chiff Chaff. This amount of singing is tiring. The blackbird takes a break. Is it listening to the bird's concert, or is it just resting? Even the jay, an avid singer, holds its beak for a moment. But suddenly something disturbs the bird's singing concert. Once the great spotted woodpecker has found a feeding place, nothing will hold him back. The squirrel is hungry too. Instead of his usual nuts, he now likes to eat tender oak and beech buds. Another squirrel is enjoying a meal on the forest floor. It appears that he has found an acorn that has survived the winter unscathed. Where one finds food, others are not far off. It looks like a proper fight. No, these two aren't just squabbling about food. There's more at stake. It's about a new mate, and that takes them up and down. Is another one joining in? This could get exciting. But instead of threatening gestures and posturing, there's only peaceful sniffing among themselves. Without a fight, the rival withdraws. Together, they even go looking for food. For me, it doesn't look like rivalry. Maybe their roles have already been determined. Last year, the middle spotted woodpecker was working on this old tree trunk, but didn't breed here. Perhaps he will this year. At least he is working hard on the nest hole. His relative, the great spotted woodpecker, has nearly completed his work. All it's missing are a few finishing touches. Even the smallest among them, the lesser spotted woodpecker, is close to completing a nesting hole.
This is what I expected of the great spotted woodpecker. He is already taking care of the interior design. Overnight, the forest looks different again, even though it is still April. The color green returns to my forest. It seems to me as if it is waking from a long winter's sleep. Fascinating things are happening here. Everything is on the move. It was winter just a moment ago and now spring begins. And I ask myself time and again, who gives the signal for this event? That for me is one of the big mysteries of nature. It seems to me that I am a witness to an ever-repeating act of creation. Where yesterday snow covered the floor of the forest, today there are brightly coloured forest flowers. Corydalis and thimbleweed. At some places they cover huge expanses of the forest floor. Another typical messenger of spring is the oxlip. The little evergreen with its blue flowers I love as much as the snow white calyx of the wood sorrels, which can now be found in abundance in the forest. Only in one place is there a beautiful plant, the name of which I sadly do not know. And it seems to me that with every look up into the trees they grow greener by the hour. I'm overcome by conflicting feelings, a little sadness, but also something like forest passion, which awakens a longing for adventure and the wish to discover new things. I believe, no, I'm sure, it is spring. The forest, my forest, just a few seconds ago, dressed in winter's garb, transformed in front of my eyes. Now winter is finally over. Up in the big nest, the black stork is keeping a watchful eye out while his partner is searching for food. And my friends, the ravens, join her in a flight over the nesting area. Now and again, one of the older birds flies back to the nest to make sure all is well. Everything is in order here. The youngsters are asleep. Now, at the end of April, a great spotted woodpecker should be finished with his nesting hole. But this one is still hard at work. From my left, I hear soft steps in the forest. Steps that keep coming closer. 
Lost in thought, a young roebuck enters the forest from the meadow. The great spotted woodpecker shows no interest in this. He has more important things to worry about. He hasn't noticed me yet. Now he has. Perhaps it would have been better if he selected a rotten old tree rather than tough oak. But the woodpecker is clever and he has sharp senses. Nothing escapes him, not even the smallest of insects. Majestically, the buzzard circles over the nesting area. I still don't know which spot he might select for his nest. He should also soon begin preparing for the mating season. The hare is still looking for a mate in the forest. while the middle-spotted woodpecker is already in the mood for marriage. I've never seen them so united in their courting display before. They don't seem to have much to say to each other because the male is already out of here. Is he heading for their nesting hole? The female doesn't follow him, whatever that means. I can already hear the song of the pied flycatcher. So this is where he lives. I shall have to make a note of that in my diary. I nearly didn't see him. That's how well camouflaged he is. He won't fly off again until the sun is out. Until then, he waits without moving on the forest floor. But a little warmth from the sun is all that's needed to start up the forest board game, and the butterfly can take off. I am delighted that on my walkabout I spot another lesser spotted woodpecker who has claimed his territory here. Of course, I make a little detour for my special friends, the squirrels. And as luck would have it, I encounter one of the little fellows. Whenever I see them, they are searching for food or squabbling with one another. But now they are checking their secret hiding places. Perhaps there are still some winter larder leftovers. The last days of April give me a taste of what to expect from the delightful month of May. It is already warm like summer, and above me the insects are swarming around in the foliage. Obviously the nuthatch has managed to chase the great spotted woodpecker from his old home. All relaxed, he is observing all from a neighbouring tree where he has found a new home. He watches as the nut hatches close up the entrance to his old home with clay so that only they will be able to enter. They like to do this to all entrances, narrowing the hatches which might explain part of their name. 
I would have liked to have continued my stroll in the forest, but slowly I have to make my way home. On the way, I am already thinking about which animals I'll look out for next time, because in May there is lots to see and experience. It is the most pleasant and exciting time in the forest. <laughs>